we're here with uh, Paul Stoller, who's a professor of anthropology at Westchester University. And the first question I usually ask everyone is, how did you get into anthropology? Um, can you give us a little background information? Well, um, I, I originally wanted to be a writer, not an anthropologist. Uh, a novelist uh, was my dream. And, um, and I didn't, uh, you know, no one encouraged me to do so because they thought the writing life was really not very good. And my mother especially said, there's no money in it. Don't go into, don't go into writing. Then I told her I wanted to maybe be, go to Africa. And she got very, very <laughs> frightened about that. And then when I finally uh, found my sort of legs in Africa, and I, 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 I was in the Peace Corps, uh, avoiding the Vietnam War. And um, in so doing, uh, I learned the Songhai language, came in contact with uh, Africans, lived in small villages, and uh, wanted to determine a way to get back there, to spend time in my life uh, in West Africa, in Niger. So first I uh, enrolled in, uh, I first studied linguistics, uh, and then I found that uh, limiting somewhat. And then I finally made my way into social anthropology and uh, made my way back to uh, Niger and began my doctoral research. Of course, when I told my, my mother that I was going to become an anthropologist, the, it was, the, 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 the reaction was even more, more trouble. She said, what, what can you do with anthropology, she said. And I said, well, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be surprised. I said, well, I hope so. But, and at, at, at any rate, the, um, uh, it took them a long time to understand what I was doing. But eventually, I, when I started publishing stuff and they started reading my books, uh, they came around to uh, understand pretty much what I was trying to do. So in a way, you started with field work before you got into anthropology yes. because you, you, were, you were living when you were with the Peace Corps for several years in, yeah. in Niger, right? Two years in Niger in two small villages um, and um, it was, I got an occupational deferment so I uh, avoided going to Vietnam. So I had my field experience before I studied and in, in, in college I was a philosophy major, I was not an anthropology major, I took one anthropology course and that it was, it was the exposure to uh, life uh, in, uh, in rural Niger among Songhai people, learning the Songhai language that uh, you know, convinced me that I wanted to study anthropology. And you started out studying linguistics. Do you think there's a, um, that language is, is obviously instrumental to engaging with others, but do you think there's something deeper about learning another language? Well, yeah. I think First of all, I think that learning the language of the people you want to do research uh, on and to want to describe is the most important thing that you can do. And I took, uh, I took great pains to learn the Songhai language. And um, so I, 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 you know, I, I studied it every day. I had tutors. And um, I got to, got to a point where I was pretty, um, I was pretty uh, fluent in it. And so that was, that was very, very important, I think, for any anthropologist to do that. But also, by learning the language, you also learn, um, you, know, they, you, you learn uh, a lot about the culture and the orientation, and uh, you, your uh, observations and your experience becomes more nuanced through uh, a subtle appreciation of the language. So I think that's really, really important. Uh, you mentioned earlier your mother was not that pleased with you doing anthropology. How did you explain what anthropology was to her? Which sort of leads me to the next question of <laughs> what is anthropology in a, in a nutshell? Well, uh, for me, um, I, uh, the way I explained it to her and for me uh, personally, I think uh, anthropology is um, telling other people's stories so that we can um, understand human difference. Uh, and in an increasingly um, globally interconnected world, uh, understanding human difference uh, has become increasingly important. So I explained to her that, you know, it's really very important for us to know how other people live, how other people, uh, their, their passions, their desires, but also their <clears throat> the conflicts in their lives, uh, their issues, basically. And uh, the more we know about how uh, other people live, the better we can live ourselves. Which is, which is a, I guess, another segue to an issue that you've been writing on the last decade or so about well-being mm -hmm. um, as an understanding difference 
but also understanding how people live differently and how well-being, when it first came out, I think was, was largely uh, around, you know, theorized or talked about in terms of measuring it yeah. and measuring it in numericals such as uh, understood by econo economists in terms mm -hmm. of here's the, a poverty level and you're either below it or above it and right. that tells us something about your well-being. Mm -hmm. You've written very differently about what well-being means. C could you just talk to well, that a little bit? Well, first of all, the, 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 what you're talking about there is the UN index mm -hmm. of um, well-being. Yeah. And there are also numerical indexes of happiness, as if you can measure well-being and happiness. And, um, you know, there is another survey done about two years ago by the Gallup, Gallup organization, and they discovered that uh, it was a happiness survey. And they were shocked by the results because the, the results indicated that um, some of the happiest people in the world live in the most dire circumstances. Seven out of the ten uh, happiest uh, people lived in places li in, in Latin America. They lived in Guatemala. They lived in Peru, Ecuador. Uh, uh, places that are, you know, Nigeria is another one. And so, um, you know, to me, uh, well-being has to do, well-being is fleeting. Uh, we're always searching for it, but it's not something that you can measure. Uh, it, it's something uh, I write about in my, in, my, in my current book, the time when I, you know, first came face to face with well-being is that I was 15 years old and I wanted to take this girl out on my first date. So I was going to, I was going to phone her. I go down to my, my basement uh, in my house and I'm all very nervous. I said, what if she doesn't know who I am? Or what if she turns me down? I'd be completely devastated, but I tried to do it. So, um, so I called her up and she did know who I was and she did accept me. We had a terrible time, <laughs> but the experience, I felt so elated that she said yes that I was willing to go on and try to do this again, you know. So, so the, uh, well, you know, so well-being, uh, we're seeking it at all different types of our lives, and uh, depending on our economic, social, personal, and cultural circumstances, what constitutes well-being may vary from place to place. But you know, um, my book, my 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 latest book, which is called Yaya's Story: uh, The Quest for Well-Being in the World, um, is about this one guy uh, who was uh, from Niger, who was an uh, uh, art trader, who was uh, basically battling cancer uh, toward the end of the book. He, he eventually goes through all sorts of chemotherapy and he's miserable and he's missing his family. And so at the end of the book we meet and, um, and uh, he tells me that he's going home. Uh, he's going to not have any more treatments. Uh, and so we both knew that that you know, would be the last time that we saw one another. And he was going home so that he could um, have a dignified death. And I found out later that you know he went home, and people came to uh, see him from far and wide to pay their respects. And so he died a comfortable uh, uh, death, uh, felt comfortable in his skin, and uh, he made the right decision. And so, uh, so there, that's another case of you know, notion of well-being. And, uh, how it affects the texture of our lives. What what sort of role do you think anthropology plays, and perhaps should play? In in you've mentioned earlier, one of the, the key role is is to, I guess, get to the bottom of difference and and tell stories about mm -hmm. um, otherness. But should anthropology go further and change the world for well, the better? Or <laughs> first of all, I think the main legacy of anthropology. Um, is not necessarily changing the world, but is ethnography. And that's what we do. Uh, we have you know, lots of different kinds of theories that we put forward. Uh, these come and go as time goes on. What was popular when I was a graduate student, uh, stru French structuralism, is no longer that much followed today. So, but what stays is ethnography, telling people stories, uh, describing people in their particular locale, describing um, uh, how they live, how they talk, their their conflicts, their passions, uh, their lives, right? And and if it is well done, that that's the sort of thing that has staying power. It's a text I like to say that will re remain open to the world. And uh, in doing ethnography, uh, eth in in telling these kinds of stories uh, from an ethnographic perspective, uh, sheds a lot more light on questions of well-being because it's nuanced, it's detailed, 
uh, it can be, sometimes the stories can be profound. They can implicate profound issues and philosophical issues. So, um, so I think that that is, that's our great contribution to the world, is ethnography. And it's one that is, uh, that has staying power. Now, it has legs. Um, in terms of changing the world, uh, I think that um, the anthropological voice has been largely missing from policy debates. And that's why, you know, I and, and an increasing number of other anthropologists are beginning to blog, uh, bringing an anthropological perspective onto public policy debates. How much influence this has, I, I don't know, but usually it has, you know, it has more influence than we probably know ourselves, of, those of us who blog. But I think it's important to get that, uh, the anthropological orientation out there in the blogosphere and in policy debates. Uh, you really don't know who's reading these things and how they might have an impact, more people than you would imagine. And so uh, I think it's, you know, as, as a scholar, uh, and as an anthropologist, it's my obligation, obviously, to do my research and teach my courses and, and et cetera, et cetera. But I also think it's my obligation to share what little wisdom I've been able to uh, acquire through the course of my long research um, and bring it to bear on public debate. Uh, people, if, and it's not a question of whether people agree or disagree with me, but to get people talking about some of these cultural and social issues that are often forgotten in public discourse. Mm. And I guess stories is, are usually something very personal and allows people to connect, yeah. and it, which is, I think is one of the strengths of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, why, why do you think storytelling um, has gone a little bit out of fashion, I guess? I remember in one of your books you wrote about uh, Walter Benjamin writing about the novel having taken over from storytelling oh, in yes. a way. Yeah. And now we live in an internet-saturated world of the short not story, but the short sort of Twitter or the, the, the shortest messaging possible, which perhaps makes it very difficult for anthropologists to, to get across their very elaborate stories and very... Sometimes, <laughs> but I, I, my struggle when I blog is I, I, my most successful blogs have won, been ones where I tell you know, a, little bit of, a little story about my students or my experience and relate it to a larger issue. Um, the struggle is, is to, to try to reduce that to 850 words, which is not easy. But it, it is doable. It is doable. And the more that I do it, the easier I find that it is, it is to do. Um, so you can do that and then provide links for people if they're interested. If the blog is uh, sort of incites interest, uh, you can do that and um, provide links and people can read on, uh, on their own further about the, these kinds of issues. But it is a challenge, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but I, you know, I still my own belief is is that storytelling is central to the human condition and no matter whether we live in a you know in the blogosphere internet age uh, uh, you know, Twitter and all of that the you know stories are there's something foundational about stories there's a there's a quote that I begin my my uh, my it's an epigraph uh, of my new book and it's from Tim O'Brien, and it's, you know, he's basically saying, I'm going to get it a little bit wrong, but stories are for those late nights where you don't know where you've, where you've been or where you're going. Stories are a fraternity. Uh, I'm sorry, stories are for an eternity. Um, and uh, when everything is lost, there is still the story there to sort of stabilize us and you know, give us, buoy us in the, the cross current of, you know, of life, which has become very complicated and complex and sometimes scary. Mm. In, in a lot of your stories, there's a lot of the anthropologist in there. Mm -hmm. so they're quite personal. Do you think that's, a, that's really important in anthropology, to, to, to allow the personal to, to be part of it? I think that you cannot separate the personal and the professional. I mean, anthropologists have been trying to do that for decades, you know, since the inception of the, uh, of the, of the discipline. But um, I find that the personal has such an impact on the nature of the intersubjective encounter with, you know, when you, when you meet someone else, whether it's in your own society or another society, the personal texture of that relationship has a tremendous bearing on what you learn. Uh, the texture of that relationship uh, is going to shape the kind of information that you, you will be able to acquire. And so in all of my field work, uh, my, uh, I feel like it's, it's not right to hide that personal relationship because those kinds of, rela my relationship with my teacher Adam Tongo, 
my relationship with uh, the filmmaker Jean Rouge, um, uh, and my relationship with this uh, man Yaya uh, uh, Haruna that I've been writing about in my new book. Um, all of that, you know, involved all of the sort of tensions and uh, the pros and cons, positive and negative aspects of personal relationships, and they all had a shape on, they all shaped uh, you know, my life uh, as a person, but also as an anthropologist. And for me, I, you can't separate the two. So I, I, I try to, you know, I can try, my first book in Sorcery Shadow, which was a memoir of my relationship to my teacher, mm. um, I tried to write it as a traditional anthropological text. And then I, I asked myself, you know, I, it wasn't very successful, I couldn't get past uh, first or second chapter. Then I took it to my teacher, and I said, uh, "Baba, you know what? You know, here's." And I, I translated the whole thing for him. It took me three months. He didn't say a word. At the end, he said, "Well, you know," uh, I said, "Baba, I'm leaving. What do you think of this book?" He said, "Well, it's not so good. Not so good." I said, "Why?" He said, "Because uh, there's none of me in it, and there's none of you in it, right?" So. Um, if you're going to write about me, you have to tell the story of our relationship, and that sort of stayed with me uh, since that early, you know, since that early encounter with him, and that convinced me to write the book as a memoir, focusing on our relationship and how it shaped my knowledge of things, uh, Songhai, Songhai sorcery, and stuff like that. I guess uh, actually, in a lot of the interviews, that's come through very strongly the, the notion of relationships and how important they are for telling stories about mm -hmm. fieldwork, but also anthropology in general. Um, that they're really f important and uh, foundational for the discipline, but also foundational for how we how we write about them. Um, one one thing that I I I got was struck by reading um, uh, one of your books. I forget which one now. Where you recount the story that that brought you on your very first sort of fieldwork um, encounter, where I think you're sitting in a hut in Mahana, and the hut. Two birds land on the hut. Oh yes, and that is a sign f f interpreted by Paul, I think, a local sorcerer. Uh, uh, Jibo. Is Jibo. Name. Jibo. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, um, a local sorcerer to take you under his wing. Yes, and it struck me because it's uh, luck in field work. Not many people write about it openly because so many things happen, and it's a lucky coincidence. And then we write our thesis about this based mm -hmm. on on luck. But it's, it's really important, I think, in, in well, field work it, it encounters. Mirror, it mirrors life. I mean, contingent, contingency, you know, luck is part of, uh, of life circumstances. And um, although from the Songhai perspective, peop Songhai people would say that it wasn't luck. You know, it was, that was destined to happen. Um, and uh, that, you know, uh, all the other things that happened to me are, are you know, were, were sort of planned out by my teacher who, you know, was waiting for me to learn enough about uh, about incantations and potions and stuff like that, so that I would be ready to start studying with him. So, and when I, after a year of studying with these guys in Mehana, I went, they said, well, we're finished, and our master wants to take you under his wing. And they said it was my Adam Ujenitongu, whom I had met before when I was a uh, Peace Corps volunteer. And so I arrived there, um, and I knocked on, you know, I clapped on the, the, the door. And he uh, invited me, he, he smiled, and, and he said, what took you so long? You know, so, <laughs> so he, he had a sense of all of this sort of thing going on. And uh, not that I can explain how he knew that, but somehow he did. Hmm. So um, in our view of things, uh, life is contingent. But in other people's view of things, life is, you know, the, there is no such thing as coincidence. And I guess as anthropologists, we often occupy this, um, what you call the in-between. The, in the space between. The, yeah. the transition zone, the liminal, yeah. whatever you want to call it, um, between different worlds. And yeah. um, again, in, in one of your books, you write about um, your own cancer treatment, mm -hmm. where you use incantations and you use things that you've learned in the field. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about, I guess, how how those two worlds come together, or what that in-between looks like for, for an well, anthropologist? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, I'll give you one, one example of that, one story. When I went for my first, uh, you know, I was diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And when I went for my first uh, chemotherapy session, I met with my, my brother came with me, and I met with my physician. And, uh, you know, 
And I was very, very nervous and frightened about the prospects of having chemotherapy. Uh, so um, he outlined what was going to happen to me, and it, none of it was very pleasant. He was a straight shooter. And I said, okay, you've told me what you're going to do, and I'm going to tell you what I want to do. And I said, let's hold hands, my brother and the, the oncologist and me. And then I recited the uh, Songhai Genji Hao. I realized that I needed something else more than what he was giving me to get through this. So I, I got this little tingling in my stomach that I used to get in Niger. And I, I realized what I needed to do, and so we recite, I recited the Genji Hao, which uh, harmonizes the force of the bush so that the, the inner dimension of my being would be in harmony with the outer dimension of my, my medical experience. At the end of that, I had to spit in the four cardinal directions in the examination room. So I went, poof, 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 spit in all directions. And you know, the, the oncologist it was pretty cool about it. He said, oh, I, that's, that's cool. I want to I uh, find out more about that. And then he went, excused himself, and then uh, came back with the sort of the levels of poison they were going to put into me. And then he took me to meet my uh, oncology nurse. Uh, and so um, she was one of the most beautiful women I had ever met in my life. And she said, Paul, I'm going to take very good care of you. So I turned to my oncologist. I said, you see, it's beginning to work already. <laughs> um, wow. But, the, but the, the, the point is, is that um, this being between um, has, has two possibilities. One, it can confuse you or rip you apart so you don't know your front side from your back side. Or you can use the position of the between, which is, you know, it's a kind of, uh, you can use the posi position of being in between to, um, to be creative, take advantage of what each dimension presents to it and uh, use that creatively to make, uh, make life sweeter for you and maybe other people as well. And that's the whole point. The point that in Sufi mysticism, the between is the space of creativity. It's the space where uh, invention and uh, innovation occur. In a way, anthropology is often navigating that, that in between. So. I think so. Uh, anthropologists, are, we're always between. We're between, we're between languages, between cultures, um, you know, be, uh, <clears throat> between uh, uh, the, the, the public and uh, the, you know, the university setting, we're between all different kinds of things. And uh, it's a difficult, you know, it's not an easy kind of negotiation. But I think ultimately, if you take the right approach to it, uh, it can be uh, extraordinarily productive and creative. Actually, you, you mentioned Sufism just now, and there's a lot of Rumi in a lot of your books, and Sufism mm -hmm. comes through. Is it because Sufism was practiced in Niger? Is that an influence? Or? Uh, well, uh, one, of the, one of the Islamic brotherhoods is a Sufi brotherhood. So, um, and a lot of the Islam in West Africa, in M Niger and Mali, is influenced by Sufism. So it's, it's more moderate and there's, there's more sort of, uh, there's more spiritual, uh, there's spiritual, spiritual nature to it. Um, and there is, you know, they bring in spirits and things like that. And they, they can encompass the pre-Islamic uh, pre religions, uh, religious practices a little bit easier, or they do. So um, there's that, but also I just, I've always been interested in Sufism and um, I know lots of people from Iran who, uh, you know, tell me Sufi stories, which are marvelous. And I sort of, I find them, they fit nicely with a lot of the things I write about. Well, a lot of it, again, is about the in-between, about that liminal space um, and, and connecting to otherness, in this, in this case, God or, or mm -hmm. the supernatural or whatever one wants I to mean, call one, it. I mean, one, one Sufi story that I can tell is, uh, well, it's, not, it's about a Sufi story, is that I have this uh, very good friend, um, and I met him in New York City, and I was, I was wondering how to begin uh, my book, uh, one of my books. Uh, it was a book of essays. And, and I had a book of Sufi stories that I was reading. He says, well, let's, mm. let's take a look at the book. I said, okay, I'm going to open it up. And the Sufi story that I happened upon, that's the one you're going to start the book with. He opened it up to the absolute perfect Sufi story to start the book. And that's, you know, it was about the, it was called The Man uh, Who Walked on Water. Uh, and I don't know if we have time for me to go into the Sufi story. But Maybe if you can just tell it, because it's a really good story. Um, and I think it relates to anthropology again. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, the man who walked in water, uh, there is this very uh, fantastic um, scholar, Islamic scholar, 
renowned, taught university, taught you know, Islamic law at the university, expert on the Sharia. And uh, he um, uh, was at a market and uh, by a river, and he heard someone reciting an incantation on an island, which was wrong. The guy was getting the, the prayer wrong, so he felt that it was his duty as a great scholar to go out there and correct this person. Uh, and he thought, you know, doing this kind of good work, maybe one day he would reach the, he would reach the, uh, the ends of his, you know, he, he, he realized his dream of walking on water. So he take, hires a boat, goes out to the, goes out to the island, you know, island, sees this old man dressed in a, a coarse robe, which is what Sufi comes from, right? So he, in his coarse robe, and he's reciting the incantation. He says, my friend, you know, it's great that you were practicing this uh, incantation, this prayer, but you're getting it wrong. It's, it's not Yahoo, it's Yahoo Ha. And the old man says, oh, thank you so much. You know, I need, uh, I want to make sure I get it correct. You know, I, it's very, very important that you, do. thank you so, so much, my friend. You've done a very good deed today. I will, I will you know, make sure that I uh, recite this prayer in the right way. So it, the guy feels real self-satisfied with himself. He goes out uh, in, the, in the canoe feeling, well, you know, I've, I'm another step closer to walking in water. And then in the middle of the river, he hears a commotion. And the guy that had, you know, and, and you know, he hears the fact that the guy is, didn't get it right, couldn't get it right. Then he, he hears uh, a commotion in the water, and the man is walking on the water. He says, excuse me, sir, but could you tell me that correction again? I can't seem to get it right. So, I mean, so, I mean, uh, for me, that is uh, an important story to, to be, um, in terms of the academic life, to, to sort of practice uh, humility and to be humble and, 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 and to appreciate the wisdom <coughs> that people have who may not appear or may not be certified as wise people, wise, wise men and women. And, um, and that's been essential to my work because some of the wisest people I've met have been illiterate, uh, living on sand dunes, dressed much like that man in the Sufi story. My teacher is that way. And uh, he was the wisest person I ever met. Part of my, 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 my uh, task has been to try to present as best I could uh, some of his wisdom to, to a more general public. Which again is a story of anthropology. When we first get into the field, we start as almost children, childlike right. creatures, yeah. having to learn everything from scratch in a way. That's right. Uh, in a very humble position. I think the last last issue I'd like to raise is um, your call. You've you've called to to reconnect with intuition and the imagination. Sort of brings us to the sensor census um, that you've you've talked about, and the importance of talking about smells, textures, sensations mm -hmm. in general. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis a textual-based sort of Eurocentric view, um, you've done that in all your work. Um, can you just give us a, a story or something that really brings that to the fore? How important it is to 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 bring it alive, I guess, on the page because the page is still the main medium that we yeah. have to communicate. Yeah. Well, I think the whole thing about the senses is to recreate. One of the great strengths of ethnography is it recreates place and space and the texture of relationships. And all of that, if it's done in an a sense, you know, if it's done without uh, evocation of the senses, that's very difficult to do. Uh, and so rather than having an evocation of a, of a place that someone can feel like, well, I, you know, they visited that place by reading that text, uh, you get some dry text uh, of some kind of explanation of this or that. Um, so um, I think that's really very important. Uh, one story I'll tell uh, that is when I was doing field work uh, in, uh, on the, in, in Niger, on, uh, on the compound of my, my, my uh, teacher, Adam Ajeni Tongo, there was a lot of strife in his uh, family. Uh, in fact, his youngest son had married this very, very beautiful woman from another ethnic group. And, um, you know, people, and she was a young woman in the compound, so she had to haul the water and do most of the cooking and stuff like that. And she was not getting along well with her husband. And I was there, so which meant that she had extra duties. She had to prepare especially fine sauces, et cetera, et cetera. And she was really irritated with him and me and everybody, right? So, um, so what did she do? Well, she prepared me a particularly foul, bad sauce. You know, um, uh, it was really bad. And so my teacher and his son were insulted that 
uh, she would prepare such a bad sauce for an uh, honored guest. And so uh, I wrote, um, I wrote uh, a piece uh, called Bad Sauce, Good Ethnography. And I uh, sort of unpacked that whole scenario. And for women in that particular circumstance, um, creating a foul-smelling, foul-tasting sauce was a way of engaging in protest. It's the only way. It was a really kind of powerful way to suggest, you know, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. Something's got to change. So she couldn't ver ver verbalize it, but by doing it by way of smell and taste, she sent a very powerful message. Um, and so to miss that sort of thing, uh, that dimension of uh, life in a compound, uh, life in a small village, uh, social life, uh, is to miss an awful lot of the, you know, the sort of dynamics of the human condition. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's fantastic. I, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you.